So um, we have an excellent panel of four clinician scholars who have spent extensive time not only working on their own tradition of medicine, but really working on bringing the principles of these other medical traditions into their work, into their research, and forging collaborations. So I'm thrilled to um, introduce them to you guys this afternoon. And what we are going to do is just have each panelist come up and give a 15-minute uh, presentation. And then we'll bring all the panelists up at the end after all the presentations are done. So we're going to start with Gen Namgyal Kusala. Um, Gen Namgyal Kusala did his medical training at Menzi Kong in Dharamsala, graduating with his Tatupa degree in 1987 and achieving his Menrampa in 1997. He's one of our most senior physicians in exile and a true mentor in forging research collaborations and integrative medicine alliances in Europe and throughout North America. While at Menzi Kong, he led numerous clinical projects, including designing the protocol for Tibetan medical clinical intervention for non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, and in 2013, published his collaboration research on Tibet medical and Western diet research approaches for weight reduction in coronary artery, artery disease patients. He's a tremendous clinician, seeing patients all over the world, and a great researcher and teacher to us and the next generation of Tibetan medical practitioners and members. Thank you so much. Genam Yo Kusala. Uh, first of all, thank you, Tony, for uh, the kind words. And I would like to take this opportunity also to thank uh, Dr. Yang Dola, uh, Yang Zumla, Love Sanla, and all the team who worked so hard for organizing this wonderful symposium. So my topic, as you already know, is regarding our research publication that was published in the year 2013. Uh, that is titled as a weight reduction in patients with coronary artery disease. That is, we compared Tibetan medicine diet and the Western diet uh, in Germany at Tübingen University. Can I just see your mic thing really quick? Is okay? The thing in your pocket. Yeah, just. So. Just before our lunch time, we were talking about the collaboration, the integration. So perhaps this uh, study that we published, that work we have done, is more kind of a collaborative work and also of an integrated medicine. Uh, so today, I would like to present here the Tibetan medicine diet. What kind of uh, result we have found doing this kind of study for a, for a period of two years. We studied more than uh, 524 patients altogether, and this was published in 2013, and the result was very significant uh, in both the uh, Tibetan medicine and West, West medicine diet, but it was most significant result, those on Tibetan medicine diet. We all know that cardiovascular disease is one of the number one cause of death globally, and it really costs so much for everyone, especially in the United States, to treat cardiovascular disease and all kinds of heart diseases. And despite all kinds of efforts, the death due to cardiovascular disease is increasing every year. Long time back, when I was in Germany, I was given a chance to observe a, uh, a surgery, bypass surgery in a German uh, operation theater. And while the, the, the surgeon was operating, he was so unhappy with his profession. He said, I have been doing this every day and I'm not happy because he said that the cases of heart cardiovascular disease the bypass surgery that he has to do every year has been increasing every year. So he thought that there's some, there's some kind of a problem in the system itself. And obesity, as we all know, is one of the major risk factors of several diseases, including various metabolic syndrome disorders like type 2, type 2 diabetes as well as hypertension and various autoimmune disorders. Now, as I mentioned before, the study was conducted between December 2008 to November 2010. And 
all the patients who were under this uh, study were screened and undergone coronary angiography at the Department of Cardiology in the University of Hospital Tübingen in Germany. So this hospital is a kind of a primary health care clinic with the inhabitant of 500,000 uh, inhabitants in the southwestern part of Germany. And in this, in this particular region, the, the socio-economic status and education level is rather quite high. And therefore, the, there is a kind of a lowest ischemic heart disease mortality rate compared to other regions in, the, in the, this part of the Germany. In this research method, we studied 524 subjects, and it was randomized, controlled, and double-blinded. It was a parallel group of half on Tibetan medicine diet that we have devised and half on Western medicine diet that was based on American uh, Heart Association diet recommendation as well as a German uh, Heart Association diet recommendation. So these were the methods observed uh, that we have done during the whole uh, study. At the presentations, all the Patients underwent a thorough physical examination with blood pressure and heart rate measurement in the lying position, body height and weight determination using calib calibrated scale, resting electrocardiogram, routine laboratory assessments including fasting glucose, glycated hemoglobin, and all these uh, cholesterol and fibrinogen and CRP levels were measured. And measurement of patient's body weight was performed in the morning with the patient wearing light cold clothing. Mild edema was permitted at the study entry and measurement of intima media thicknesses were done. And other medical parameters, the body weight, BMI, total cholesterol, and blood pressure, blood sugar, and the CRP protein, fibrinogen, and HD and LDL cholesterol were measured. And these were the inclusive criteria Patients were eligible to be selected under the study if they are present either for the elective coronary angiography or for suspected acute coronary artery disease. Further inclusion criteria embrace the presence of overweight defined as BMI more than 25 uh, kilograms per metric square, which is based on according to the World Health Organization criteria and at least two other factors defining the presence of a metabolic syndrome. With, on, with an increased cardiovascular risk profile. Patients had to have significant CAD as verified by coronary angiography and defined as a stenosis of more than 50% in at least one of the major coronary artery or the branches. And these are the additional inclusive criteria. The blood pressure must be raised, the systolic above 130, and the diastolic above 80 and the treatment of previously diagnosed hypertension. And the elevated fasting plasma glucose must be more than 100 milligram per deciliter of previously diagnosed type 2 diabetes mellitus. And lipid alterations such as rate triglyceride 150 milligram per deciliter above, reduced high density lipoprotein, cholesterol less than 40 in men and uh, less than 50 milligram per deciliter in women, or specific treatment for these lipid abnormalities. And these are the exclusive criteria. The, if any of these are present, we exclude them in the study. So those above, uh, below 18 years of age, inability to give or lack of informed consent, pregnant women, and historic of psychiatric disease, malignancy cases, connective tissue disease, thyroid conditions, patients with terminal uh, stage of renal disorders, current use of st steroids, hormonal replace replacement therapy, current signs of infectious diseases, sepsis, and cardiogenic shock at <coughs> presentation. And randomization and dietary intervention. It is a randomized assigned to receive dietary and behavioral advice according to one or two dietary programs. Randomization was performed drawing sealed envelope with intervention assigned and closed. Western diet, which is which we call the here in the usual care, was designed from diet and lifestyle recommendation for cardiovascular disease 
risk reduction issued by American Heart Association Nutrition Committee and National Society such as the German Academy and Society of Nutrition Medicine. Tibetan diet was based on the principle of Tibet, traditional Tibetan medicine and, and adapted to the food availability in the Western world and in particular in Germany and in particular to German food hierarchy. Patients received personal dietary and behavioral advice at study entry according to the assigned protocol that is double blinded by medical personnel trained in dietary counseling. Thus patients were encouraged to start the respective program immediately after hospital discharge to complete a nutritional dairy, dairy and to call the physician in charge for questions and problems. In addition, patients were con contacted through auxiliary healthcare providers by telephone for a structured interview of five to 10 minutes at least four times while in the study to test adherence, to ensure compliance, and to discuss possible problems with the diet, to re reconfirm the follow-up visit at six months and to obtain follow-up information at 12 months. So these are the study procedures, usual care. We have uh, 262 and under Tibetan medicine diet care, 262. And then you find the follow-up. And after 12 months of, uh, of study, in the end we had 243 under usual care. And in, under Tibetan medicine diet, we had 251 in the Tibetan medicine diet care. Okay, now concerning, uh, concerning Tibetan approach, we have to understand before we, we devise a Tibetan, uh, Tibetan diet recommendation, we have to understand few things. For example, now let's take a case of a heart. Heart as an organ in Tibetan medicine is a lung organ. So ha heart is susceptible to lung kind of disorder. And artery, blood vessels, you know, we have the artery, we have the veins, and as far as artery is concerned, it is again uh, a vessel that is most susceptible to lung kinds of uh, disorders. And atherosclerosis means since there is too much of excess accumulation in the blood vessels, such kind of a condition is considered, we can put that as an increased form of a pecan or phlegmatic condition in the system. And arteriosclerosis is kind of a disturbed lung. since Lung can be increased or reduced or disturbed. In the case of arteriosclerosis, we, we, we assign that as a kind of a disturbed lung. So this is perhaps an integration method of applying this uh, kind of study. And regarding metabolic syndrome, high blood pressure, for example, is elevated lung, elevated cholesterol and excessive pecan, elevated triglyceride, of course, as an excessive pecan high blood glucose and excessive lung, and fibrinogen and excessive internal TEPA. Okay, some of those who, most of you may be familiar with the Tibetan medicine because when we speak of high blood glucose, the cause of a high blood glucose is basically a due to excessive uh, sugar or excessive pecan in the system. But when the high blood sugar or the diabetes mellitus becomes a disturbed condition in the system, it is the lung energy that is mostly disturbed. And therefore, it is really very difficult to becomes a difficult and complicated situation to treat that kind of a situation. So diabetes mellitus at the situation when it when it manifests it is a lung, but as a causative factor it is a pecan. So therefore we put this as an excessive lung uh, kind of a condition as a metabolic syndrome. And constitution and weight, underweight as a lung condition, normal weight as a TEPA condition, overweight as a pecan constitution, and obese person and excessive pecan. So as we know, you know, as according to the weight in Tibetan medical text, we normally categorize that as a lung, TEPA, and pecan. So based on that, uh, what was recommended in our classical text, we put that in this kind of category. Okay, now how we really have to devise a Tibetan diet approach uh, to compare and to compete with the American Medical Association diet and a, and a traditional Tibetan diet. So therefore we have, since we have these uh, organs and these metabolic syndrome according to our Tibetan approach, we have to figure this out. We have to try to find out how to increase the fire element in the body. 
and improve the metabolic function, that is by improving the digestive heat or the fire element or the tipa. And therefore, try to incorporate all kinds of warm, cooked, light and easily digestible foods, that is what is available in the, in the German uh, society in that particular region. And to remove extremely cold, frozen, bitter and fast and all kinds of artificial foods. So, during the study we used these food items as a recommendation according to Tibetan principle, we used most of these. I mean, we of course recommended, advised patients, those in Tibetan approach, the patient or the, the subject themselves are not aware of what they are taking, but these were the recommended ones. So, all seafoods except the tin foods, the cereals and spices, mostly the warm spices and among sweets only the honey was allowed and in the vegetables again we have the warm and the nutritious or the, the oily qualities of, of those vegetable contents and the fruits mostly like pomegranate and mango and sweet cherry, nectarine and all these kinds of fruits which are light and uh, warming and fatty acids all these olives, sesame, linseed, walnut and dairy products, unskimmed milk or yogurt less than 3.5 percent fat and cheese less than 45 percent fat. And these were Tibetan diet restricted foods. So, seafood, we restricted tin seafoods and cereals, mill millet, spices, chili and curry, pork, and mutton as well, vegetables we use uh, tomato, pepper, detender, uh, eggplant, white beans, cucumber as the restricted vegetables, coconut, deep fried food, mayonnaise, lard, whipped cream and creamers as the dairy products, coffee, black tea, alcohol, beer, sugary as the beverages and fruits, raw apples, pineapple, banana, kiwi, strawberry, currant and watermelon. These were the chief recommended as well as restricted food items and when they really need to take more uh, then they have to consult the, uh, the nutritionist for certain uh, changes in between. Now, as far as ratio recommendations concerned, we recommended that they need to take less than 30 percent of or less than that as a cereal and 70 percent or more as a protein rich foods vegetables, fruits and others. So, that is recommended ratio according to Tibetan diet approach. In order to preserve, promote digestive heat, warm up the system, improve the circulation and to look after all these uh, heart and other conditions. So, these are the results. Okay. As you perhaps know that Tibetan medicine in our Gishi it is recommended that we need to reduce weight for cases like heart disease, cancer and all kinds of circulatory disorders and diseases like uh, autoimmune disorders. So, as, as a here you will find that those in the Tibetan diet after 6 months and 12 months has reduced quite tremendously as compared to usual care. And you will find here that body mass index was also significantly reduced on those who are on Tibetan diet. And total cholesterol, the initial level of total cholesterol was sim same in both cases but after 6 months and 12 months, those on Tibetan diet, especially or during 6 months, those on Tibetan diet have reduced tremendously. And this is CRP protein and those on Tibetan diet again reduced much more than usual care. You see, in, in Tibetan medicine, we normally take care of treating a hidden fever. That means, the, there is inflammation in the system, which is not manifested outside as a symptoms. So, 
So therefore, whatever inflammation has been accumulating in the system remains inside. So therefore, most of our Tibetan medicine treatment, when we treat a disorder, we are trying to harmonize energy. In, in this approach, main issue was to, to find out, to get rid of or to eliminate the hidden fever from our body. So therefore, as we already know, that CRP, the raised CRP level seems to be connected with the hidden fever. So therefore, our diet recommendation somehow has worked uh, in six months level, that the diet, Tibetan diet has reduced significantly the CRP protein level compared to the usual care. And it's also case here with the fibrinogen. LDL cholesterol, so here is the conclusion. You know why we have the, this hypothesis to study this ob obesity and coronary artery disease with the Tibetan diet was because there was this there was a study that the Tibetan people BMI was much lesser than other minorities in, in Tibet as well as in China. So therefore, we, we had to find out that the, there may be something in a Tibetan diet that has contributed to the less BMI level in the Tibetan population, Tibetan ethnic group. So to find out that Tibetan medicine approach should, must be applied, so we applied that and when we applied that, we found out that Tibetan diet has much more ef effect than normal usual care diet recommendation. So in conclusion, this kind of a Tibetan protocol has of course reduced weight and BMI significantly with the patients with CAD and metabolic syndrome after six months. However, we have to use large multicenter studies to substantiate again this kind of a current finding. And Tibetan diet protocol may have significant effect in inducing lipid modifying and anti inflammatory effects. So, thank you so much for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you again, Namgyal Kusala. One of the things that I love about this study is it allows for um, the Tibetan physician to really be free to give complete. Um, uh, approach from the Tibetan medical perspective on uh, diet and lifestyle, and um, I think we rarely see this kind of research done, so it's, it's been really exciting um, to see this. So I'm going to uh, ask for Dr. Miriam Cameron to now take the podium. She is the lead faculty of the Yoga and Tibetan Medicine Focus Area and graduate faculty of the Earl Beckin Center for Spirituality and Healing at University of Minnesota. She did her BS and MS in nursing, MA in philosophy and bioethics, and PhD in nursing and philo philosophy of bioethics at the University of Minnesota. She has more degrees than most people that I know. Um, she's done nine years of funded postdoctoral st study in nursing and cross-cultural ethics at the University of Minnesota, Georgetown University, University of Illinois, Chicago, University of Wisconsin-Madison, and the Midwest Bioethics Center. So I met Mim, first of all, when I was a first-year medical student at Menzikong in Dharamsala. <laughs> she's been leading a decade of programs with University of Minnesota healthcare practitioners coming to, to Menzikong doing exchanges where she's been teaching a semester-long course on Tibetan medicine um, with Dr. Tenzin Namdul for Thanks. part of that. And then bringing these healthcare practitioners to Mensi Khan to do in-depth training there um, and then share some of their insights through research projects to the Mensi Khan community. So I think it really embodies this uh, integrative collaboration that allows for sharing on both sides and deep learning. And she's done incredible work also um, throughout these years. So we're really um, <laughs> fortunate to have her here. And she's now launching, it sounds like, collaborations in Amdo as well in Qinghai. So we're excited to see where she's going. I don't think she's retiring anytime soon, <laughs> even though she keeps promising to do so. So thank you so much for being thank here. You. And thank she's you. just in press, hot off the press, uh, hopefully in uh, press. In press. Um, a, a, a book on Tibetan medicine's ability to inform <laughs> self-care and uh, bringing these Tibetan medical principles into healthcare practitioners' lives. So we're excited to see that soon. And thank you so much, Dr. Cameron. Thank you. Thank you.
Tasha DeLay, everyone. You want to say it back to me, Tasha DeLay? I'm delighted to be here. Yangjun invited me to all five conferences. This is the first time I've been able to make it, and so I'm glad to be here. And many of you are, have faces that I'm familiar with, and so I'm happy to see you. Okay, uh, I'm the one who, with Tenz and Namdo, we developed the Constitutional Self-Assessment Tool and Lifestyle Guidelines Tool. And, um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about this. This is what Yangjun asked me to talk about. But first, I'll tell you why I got involved with this, because people always ask me. I have a PH, I'm a PhD RN with nine years of postdoctoral work. Why are you teaching Tibetan medicine? And I respond, because I'm passionate about Tibetan medicine. I think that it, especially the teachings about healing the mind and, 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 uh, and transforming the fear about death and dying, these are incredible teachings. And many students take my courses because of stress reduction. So um, I, am, I, I promote Tibetan medicine whenever I can. But I first got started back in 1994. I was invited to give nine lectures about nursing ethics at Seoul National University. And I read a little bit about Tibetan, or excuse me, Korean traditional medicine. And then my husband was with me, and we took a tour of China and a took a tour of Japan. And it turned out our tour director in China was Tibetan. And we just loved him. And I called him Karma because uh, uh, it was an easy name. We weren't familiar with Tibetan names at the time. And we said, next time you go to Tibet, would you take us? And he said, yes. And so after we got back to Minnesota, we got involved with the Tibetan community there. And it turns out we have the second largest Tibetan community in the US right in Minnesota. Right now, there are about 5,000 Tibetans, and they're a wonderful gift to Minnesota. Uh, we have four doctors of Tibetan medicine in Minnesota, in addition to Tenzin, and I work very closely with them. And we have somebody from Minnesota right here. She's a hospitalist, and we're very happy to have her here. She's a member of the Tibetan Nurses Association that I went to about a week and a half ago or so. But anyway, uh, then uh, Mike and I went to Tibet with uh, the person we called Karma in 1997. And I had my first consultation at the Mensicon, and it was amazing what those doctors told me about myself. But what really changed, transformed my life was we climbed a mountain to a poor nunnery uh, east of Lhasa, and I met a little Tibetan nun. She couldn't speak English, and I couldn't speak Tibetan. But five minutes in her presence, changed my life. It was absolutely incredible. And I just felt like any negativity in me just was washed away. So now when I give lectures to medical students and doctors and nurses, I say, even five minutes in the presence, in your presence, can change somebody's life. It's about the energy you have much more than even what you do, because that was my experience. So then, um, so that was in 1997, and I came back vowing to somehow include Tibetan medicine in, in my work. So in, in, by that time, I was a faculty member at the University of Minnesota, and uh, in 2001, my husband and I went to the Mensikong in Dharamsala for the first time. And I set up a formal relationship with them, and then at that time, Tenzin agreed to be, he was a faculty member there, and he agreed to be my contact person. So Tenzin and I have worked very closely together all these years. He speaks and reads fluent Tibetan, and I speak and read fluent English. <laughs> Although I read Tibetan books that, like the Gushi, I'm very familiar with the Gushi, because the Mensikong has translated it, all four tantras now, into English. And it's an amazing book to read. It's one of the great books of, of uh, the world, I think. Okay. So I want to talk to you about uh, how we came about developing the constitutional self-assessment tool. And Tens and I did this together. OK, I'm a faculty member at the early Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing. And we have been in practice nearly 25 years. And our focus is integrative care. And we talk about many different traditions. And we're not trying to produce Tibetan doctors or Chinese medicine doctors. 
We, are, we have uh, students from across campus, but particularly health professionals, physicians, nurses, people in public health, pharmacists, and so on, coming in to learn more about holistic care. And so I'm not a Tibetan doctor. I don't pretend to be. But I teach Tibetan medicine from the perspective of how can you use Tibetan medicine as self-care and as part of integrative care. And back to the question about integrative care, how we view it is that integrative care provides more options. So if I just have allopathic care, my options are limited. And they're good if I need surgery or, or um, medications or technology. But they are less good about how to live a happy life, how to heal my mind, how to get, get ready well for death. So that's where Tibetan medicine is preferable. And so we have a variety of courses. And just so you know, just go to csh.umn.edu. We have a ton of free information about all these healing practices that you are in. It was um, funded by NIH. So the government wants us to learn more about integrative care so that we, develop, we practice self-care and reduce the health care dollar. <laughs> Okay, and we are at the University of Minnesota. So if you see sort of a red building in the back on the right side, that's where we're located. Although we're getting a new building. Okay, so Rigpa, the Tibetan Science of Healing, offers an ancient, timely model for the promotion of health and treatment of disease, lack of ease, by teaching individuals to make healthy lifestyle choices. This holistic model consists of analyzing one's unique inborn constitution and making supportive lifestyle changes. I'm reading it to save time. <laughs> An experienced MENPA is the gold standard for constitutional self-assessment. Uh, Research-based tools are needed for education and self-assessment involving SOAR RIGPA, co commonly known as Tibetan medicine. So we did not find any research-based tools for self-assessment in Tibetan medicine. Now, since 2003, working with, with uh, Tenzin, plus three or do other doctors from the Mensikong, I developed a course about Tibetan medicine at the University of Minnesota. And I've been teaching it ever since. And it's very popular. It's almost always full with a wait list. And now I teach it online. So all of you can take it if you want to take an eight-week intensive course about Tibetan medicine. And I think that you have flyers. Yeah in case you're interested. Uh, and um, you're welcome to come. And again, uh, we get physicians, nurses, uh, you know, name it, people who take this course. And people primarily take it so that they can lead a more relaxed life, ha happy life. The purpose of life is to be happy, which is amazing for me to hear. I'm the daughter of a fundamentalist evangelical Lutheran minister. And so happiness was not one of the teachings. So that's one of my reasons for fascination with Tibetan medicine is because it's all about how can I set up a life to be happy, and then if I'm happy, I'm, be I'm better able to reach out and help others. Okay, so I started teaching this, the Tibetan medicine course. It's a two-credit graduate course in 2003, and I'm teaching it right now as I'm here because it's online, and I get emails from students. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, students wanted to learn more. So I said, well, you can't really learn about Tibetan medicine unless you go to India and visit Mensgang. So in 2005, with Tenzin's help, I set up a course to take students to Mensgang. And that course has been going every year since then. In fact, we have set up the course for this spring. So the next time the students will go will be during May session, which is a break at the university. And again, many physicians and nurses have gone to Mensikong. About 1,000 students so far have taken the Tibetan medicine course. And I'd say about 200 have taken the India course. Uh, and so it's made quite an inroad in Minnesota. Uh, and so the students wanted to know how to understand their constitution. And because there are many tools out there, but we couldn't find one we liked. So Tenzin and I created the constitutional self-assessment tool. And then we gave it to the students, and they said, oh, OK, now I know my constitution better, but so what? What do I do about that? So we created the lifestyle guidelines tool. 
Okay, the CSAT and LGT are based on the Gushi. Again, I read the Gushi in English. Tenzin read it in Tibetan, and then we talked. And these are, uh, these are the references. The CSAT I ideally identifies the individual's inborn constitution. Now, if you, if you do the CSAT and your energies are not in balance, then it's, it will identify your dominant energy, which may not be the dominant energy in your constitution. And so it's best to try to do the CSAT when you're feeling normal. So of course my students say, I've, I've never felt normal. Um, and then if you, here's the publication with it. And if you read the instructions, uh, there were some questions about the CSAT yesterday. And I can answer those questions. Those are questions that students always ask. But if you can read the instructions in the, in the article, that would be great. And then I'm going to give you a link that you can do it free on the University of Minnesota website, free and confidential. So I always give this, the link to the students. That's where they do the CSAT and LGT. But in the back of this article, here, the C, I have the CSAT and LGT published so that anybody can use them. I won't even try to do it, but here in the article. And at the beginning of it, there are instructions about what to do. So just so you know, we're born with a particular constitution of, that uh, we have three energies, lung, teep, and bacon, and they equal 100%. So in my case, I have some lung. I have more of a teep, a bacon constitution, bacon, teep, so those are higher than lung. So if I let one energy go up, it's going to affect the other energies. And our energies rise and fall during our, our life because of what we eat, our stress, if it's cold, if it's hot. So we need to make choices to keep our energies in harmony with, our, with their percentages in our inborn constitution. So the CSAT can help us do that and see if we're out of balance. And it can also identify uh, our constitution if we're in balance. And the Mensacong now uses the CSAT uh, and the Mensakong helped us to develop it. They use it for non-Tibetans who come to the, visit the Mensakong to learn about Tibetan medicine. Then in the lifestyle guidelines tool, you use the column of your dominant energy. Even if it's not the dominant energy in your constitution, if it's the dominant energy in your CSAT result, then use that. And the lung column will calm lung. lung the tipa column will cool tipa, and the bacon column warms bacon. OK, so we did research. We put together a research team, including two physicians. The objective to test the validity of and refine the CSAT and the LGT, mixed methods, uh, six senior doctors at the Mensacong, and they, said, and, and they assessed for content validity and they agreed 100% that the CSAT and the LGT reflect Tibetan medicine. They're consistent with Tibetan medicine. And then we had 88 students at the University of Minnesota take the tools. And of course, we met all the ethical requirements. OK, so phase one, the senior doctors evaluated the validity. We had 59 students take the CSAT, then have a Tibetan medicine consultation to see what is the relationship between their CSAT result and the Tibetan medicine consultation. And then we had, we te those students didn't know anything about Tibetan medicine. Then we did it with a group of 29 students who were studying, taking the Tibetan medicine course, so they already knew something about Tibetan medicine. And then we used quantitative and phenomen phenomenological analysis to assess the agreement of the CSAT results and consultations and refine the tools. And the CSAT and the LGT had high 100% content validity. And what we found is that the CSAT had 76% agreement, a 0.50 kappa statistic, meaning moderate criterion validity, and I'll explain that. And we concluded that the refined CSAT and the LGT demonstrate the potential for additional research and use in self-care. Now we learned that this is the way to increase the CSAT result. If you learn about Tibetan medicine before you take it, you'll know better how to respond to the items. 
Keep, keep, uh, complete the CSAT when you're feeling like yourself. Complete the CSAT in a quiet, reflect, reflective setting with no time restrictions. And the research shows that uh, most of us are not good at doing self-assessment because we don't know ourselves well enough. So we need to consult with someone who knows as well, like with a parent, a partner, uh, and so on. And then we, uh, many of our students were so stressed out, they thought they had a lung constitution, and in fact, their lung was too high. And so I think it's very easy with a stressful life in the, in the US to over-report lung. And complete the CSAT not to get an A, but who you really are, not the person you wish you were. And then finally, um, I have some resources. So if you want to do this online, and I don't know if this link works, and we could go into it. We have a very nice website. How could I do that? I don't know. Anyway, that's the link, and it goes into a very nice web page where all the instructions are and the items. You can do the CSAT, the LGT right there. And there's the publication. And then um, it, how we use it in the Tibetan medicine course, but I use it for many different things. Each student completes the CSAT, uses the CSAT result to complete the lifestyle guidelines tool, and then creates a personal plan for living in harmony with his or her own constitution. So the CSAT, LGT, course websites, uh, Tibetan medicine practicum, required reading, and consultation with an experienced menpa help students to use solar rigpa self-care and an integrative care. Here are more resources. I book, wrote a book about going to Tibet, Karma and Happiness, and that's a required textbook for the Tibetan medicine course. I just published the first uh, literature in, in nursing literature. This is in a book that goes all over the world. It's the first uh, literature about Soa Rigpa in nursing. And so I'm quite excited about that. And, um, and then the book that Tenzin and I just wrote. And I just uh, sent the files to the publishing company last Friday. <laughs> so that's exciting. And then here is some online free uh, material that you can read this, Cameron, Nelmdol, and Swenson. Free the, free, uh, read that before you do the CSAT, and you'll do better. You'll, you'll uh, do a more accurate CSAT. And then here's the, uh, the Gushi again. Um, here's a Tibetan medical dietary book. That one has a very good assessment tool, but it hasn't been validated. We use that. And then finally, we use the Mensikon book, Fundamentals of Tibetan Medicine. But it's very difficult for students to understand that book, so that's why I have them use my book, Karma and Happiness. Then they understand better. Then they can go in and understand fundamentals better. OK, why study Soa Rigpa? Here's what one student wrote in her evaluation. And this pretty much represents what all the students write. And I'll let you read it. The evaluations are excellent. The students are very grateful. And this is an elective. You know, it's not, not a course they have to take. OK? And Thochi Chi and Tashi Delay. And this is Minnesota. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cameron. It's been wonderful to see how many healthcare practitioners have come to Menzikong over the years. And, and stayed, <laughs> never went home. Um, they've been coming back again and again over the years. It's been really wonderful work. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tam Nagoyan. Um, Tam, uh, Dr. Nagoyan did her medical training at Heidelberg University in Germany, and she's been working as an internal medicine doctor for six years in Switzerland. She's board certified as an internist, and the last two years she's been working with a private medical group called MetBase, allowing her to introduce Solarikba diagnostics and therapeutics in her outpatient groups um, that have various specialties, but primarily specialize in primary care and sports medicine. She met Dr. Nita in 2009 when he was teaching in Germany, and they co-founded the Sori Kong International Together, the first officially recognized NGO in Germany, I believe, um, throughout Europe. So they have now 70 branches all over the world. I think they're just missing Antarctica. And <laughs> we're looking forward to hearing her work and clinical perspectives, a case report on 
using and implementing Tibetan medicine in her practice as a Western medical doctor um, in a very rare experience. So welcome, Dr. Nguyen. Is it okay like this? Probably it might be maybe so. Okay. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk here. Um, so I came all the way from Switzerland um, to here just to um, talk about my experiences. Um. So um, I was told that I have to talk about um, the constitutions and the waste products uh, in Tibetan medicine. So um, I, I didn't actually include this <laughs> directly as such in my uh, daily practice. So I was, um, I was thinking that I would just have a case presentation <coughs> about something um, very common, commonly known. And um, I'd like to present it from my perspective as one of the very few Western medical doctors trying to bridge um, to a holistic and natural medical system and use it in their daily practice because the situation in Europe is not um, that open um, for integrating both. There's a constant fight between naturopath or natural practitioners and Western medical doctors. And um, I had this great opportunity and chance from my employer that I was basically free to do whatever I wanted. So I, I grabbed that chance and I, um, I took that chance and I just started experimenting with Sova Rikpa in my daily practice. So it's something very new. I don't think there's any template or any, um, any guideline how to do that. So I just tried to just um, develop it as it comes. So I did my medical training, um, my Sovadikpa medical training with Dr. Nida Chenakzang in, in our organization, Sorekang International. At that time it was called International Academy for Traditional Tibetan Medicine. Maybe you've heard that name. So I've been um, also teaching uh, about Sovadikpa and um, in our organization and I've developed the program that tries to focus on advanced training, meaning that we offer education for, um, for our health, for healthcare practitioners throughout globally um, that are interested in Sovarikpa. Okay, so as announced, I'd like to use, I'd like to present a case that um, deals with headache. I think that's something very commonly known around the world. And many of my patients would come to me and ask me if there's any options for treating that. So um, this is one of my, this is one case, but I do have so many cases. And this includes, I guess, almost daily treatment of my colleagues. Like we have many assistants and nurses in our um, center. We are about, like that's a typical chain center in Switzerland, having like about 15 doctors and 30 nurses, something like this. And they would come to me, I guess, for a free treatment on an almost daily, <laughs> on an almost daily basis. But um, I'd uh, have my patients also benefit from my experiences and knowledge about headache. So yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, when a patient comes to me, I would try to implement. Um, methods used in Sovarikpa, meaning that I would try to explain to them about the pathology. And I would uh, very often start from a Western perception, because that's what they're used to. So most of my patients actually are Swiss people. And they have never heard about Sovarikpa, because that's quite unknown yet in Switzerland or in Europe. So I would explain to them a little bit about pain receptors, and that there are multiple causes like stress, lack of sleep, fatigue, whatever. There are so many causes. And um, I would explain to them that there are different types of headache. Um, primary headaches, as most people experience, are probably or very usually benign, so they wouldn't have to worry because many patients would come and say, please, can I have a CT scan or an MRI because I'm worried. I'm having a headache for many years now. And 
um, I'm worried there's a tumor growing in my head or something. So I would have to convince them to first calm down a little bit and not be too worried. And there's, um, I think there's sufficient um, uh, statistics and uh, research to support that most of the headache is actually harmless. So I would explain to them about the different types of headaches um, according to Western medicine with tension type headache being the most common one. I think affecting, you see it here is um, the one presented in the middle. Um, I think uh, according to statistics like one third, no maybe not one third, but probably almost every person experiences headache at one point in their life at least once. Um, but at any time probably one fifth of the whole population is affected by this type of headache. And migraines would be probably a little bit uh, not that often. And cluster headache would be something very rare. And yeah, it is that common. It is after, I think, uh, besides back ache, headache is the most commonly experienced um, physical discomfort. So. Yeah, and then there's the part about the treatment. Usual treatment, as my Swiss patients know, is just about pain medication. They can go to a pharmacy and get the medication without doctor's prescription, usually. So I would explain to them that there's this option and they have a tool for self-treatment, even though it's a very specific way of self-treatment. Um, uh, but at least they have something to keep control of their life because many patients would uh, not know that they could get this medication without prescription and that's why they sometimes come to the doctors um, in the first place. Okay, so stress. I think that's a dog that looks stressed. So that's why I put that picture there. So stress. I think stress is commonly known as one of the main causes for any kinds of diseases but probably um, very likely also for headache, right? So stress is something that most of my patient, patients are fed up with because they know they are stressed and they have basically no good way to cope with that stress. So after I explained about the uh, Western medical approach to headache, I would then explain to them the, the, a different approach from Sova Rikpa. So I think um, it has been mentioned here a couple of times that there are like basic um, energies or principles, however you want to call them. We call them Nyepa in Tibetan language. And the literal translation would be fault, which is kind of hard to understand for everyone. So I usually introduce these as different kinds of energies. And um, if the, the different types of headaches, um, I, I would assign the different types of headaches to these different types of energies that now you've been a little bit more familiar with. And um, the lung type headache in Tsovarikpa is very often um, associated with like emotional problems, something like that. That's why I think the, the bridge is very clear that this is the headache that I would um, connect with the most common, common, common stress type related headache, the tension headache. And cheaper headache, um, I, would, I would associate that with uh, migraine. It has that nature of being very, very sharp and sometimes people would even have an aura seeing like different lights. So chipa is that energy that is more connected to um, hot, to, to something very light, at the same time very strong. So this migraine headache is something that is usually, is usually stronger than uh, the tension type headache. And it's also very pulsating um, and um, would very often come triggered by different events, like it can be seasonal, it can be monthly, something like that, giving a very um, regular appearance, something like that. And peck and headache, to be honest, I don't very often meet that. So peck and headache, I would describe as something um, rather um, heavy, rather dull, rather hard to describe. So there's, there's been only one patient complaining about something foggy in his mind connected with something he perceives as headache. And I've yet to discover a way to help him. He's been coming 
on an almost weekly basis for more than a year. Um, but <laughs> in any case, um, something Pekin, Pekin is that rather cold and heavy energy, rather foggy or unclear energy. Um, and that's, uh, I guess it's rather rare. So I guess in my explanation, the cluster headache, which can have very specific reasons, but Western medicine doesn't know yet all the different factors. I guess the cluster headache could be a combination of two of them or a very strong expression of the Chipa headache. That would be my interpretation, but I very rarely have real cluster headache patients. They are also said to be rather rare. So I would explain to them about these principles to my patients. And um, I would explain that um, because there is a, um, a structural substance or structural, structural equivalent, that's the cause, that's why it's possible to have any problem with it. So saying something like, if you don't have a head, you wouldn't have headache. So explaining it like this, patients are much more happy to accept that lung energy, which is inherent in every person's constitution, as we heard before, is the cause of, uh, or can contribute to having this lung type headache or tension headache. And um, so, and this lung energy, literal translation would be motion. Most people translate it as wind energy or wind. So this motion is a principle that's like basic to life, right? Our whole universe um, is moving. Every atom is moving. Every mole molecule is moving. And um, so with this explanation, I can also explain that there's emotional movement or emotional waves, something like this. And with, that, with this explanation, my patients would easier accept that stress is something that you can actually perceive in a different way, can, and you can work with it, um, coming from the perspective of Sova Rikpa. So I'd like to explain a little bit about this lung energy, um, especially for those who don't know so much about Sova Rikpa. So this lung energy is the main principle in Sova Rikpa. Oh, just having. <laughs> um, so, um, as I said, every molecule, the the, the yeah, every actually um, our whole universe is consists is consists of lots of emptiness, but then there is some kind of little matter or substance and there's like atomic spin or stuff like that. So signifying that everything that we experience is based on something that is not standing still, but in motion. So we can find this principle not only in our body, but in the whole world. But we particularly find it in our body through like cellular activity. Every cell is having like a metabolism. Um, we experience it on a bigger level like our heartbeat is as long as we live our heart beats or our breath is like a constant moving or uh, movement of something so that principle is very basic to life essentially so um, similarly um, the principle of cheaper this hot energy is represented in your temperature for example or your metabolic like chemical reactions and the principle of this Pekin energy is represented as um, the, the solid or watery aspects of your body. Like every cell is like having an actual substance that is having a certain weight. So, um, so this energy um, is having like this, uh, this energy of Lung is having this inherent nature of motion and um, in old times, I guess, um, there wasn't any way to measure it. So people would just talk about energies, like it's the life force here. I'm using Iron Man here because it's very clear he's having like a lung type energy battery in his, uh, instead of his heart. Um, and in old times, people would talk about the um, lung energy running in our nervous system, or white channels as they call it in Tibetan uh, medicine. And no one, no one, uh, people had to trust in it because we couldn't measure like electric potential as we can do today. But nevertheless, that is the principle that we can now measure. And um, 
Um, because in older times, I'm talking about many hundreds of years ago, people could not measure. They had to find other ways how to deal with this energy. So, um, yeah, in any case, um, they, uh, they would perceive it as something they probably have to trust in, something, an energy that you can't see, that you can maybe feel, but um, it's kind of hard to perceive, like as we have today, black on, on, on paper, uh, written on paper. Um, but they learned how to cope with this kind of energy and work with this energy as a result of not having this modern um, techniques or um, machines to deal with this energy. So coming from that perspe perspective and that nowadays we can actually prove it, like we can prove this idea of the little microorganisms that was introduced in Sovadik by like, or introduced like long time ago. Now we can prove it. It means that the people were right at that time. And at the same time, they were able to include like a more holistic view, um, connecting not only the physical level, but connecting the mind with the body level. So coming from these explanations, um, I think that uh, my patients gain a lot of trust in um, having a combined therapy of Western medicine where you don't neglect the physical level. We do have great achievements in Western medicine, but include this mental level in a rather scientific way. So kind of um, explain it to them so they can really understand it. So um, as I said, this is a picture of, I think, neurons. Um, and this is a picture of the of bacterial, I think. So you can see that nowadays we see these pictures. At all times they had these pictures somehow. They found these pictures or they found these explanations without having a microscope. So I think this is very impressive. And I think it's just a matter of time and more research and, um, um, and looking for it, asking for it, that we can eventually explain more and more about the subtle levels of different energies. I think about mind, it's possible, but maybe it takes a few thousand years, I don't know. So um, I want to quickly present a case. So this is a 54-year-old, um, um, quite sportive farmer. And she came to me with a headache for two years, which uh, worsening. And it was basically there more or less like 70% of the time. And she would complain about pressure on her head and sometimes she would have symptoms of vomiting. She had lower back pain and anxiety attacks. So I think that um, you can already have this association with the, like some kind of mental level of stress. Um, and she was using already lots of medication prescribed by doctors. Actually, she was referred to me by one of my colleagues and she was using different kind of painkillers, basically the whole range of painkillers that is available. And most of them do require prescription from doctors. Um, and since there was no significant effect for the past two years, she was kind of giving up. But yeah, she gave it a try because there is nothing she could lose, right? Oh, what did I do here? Oh, okay, okay. I don't know what I did. It. <laughs> okay. So um, I checked more about her diet and lifestyle to get an idea about what the causes could be according to Sovarikpa. So she had a pretty good healthy diet. She looked like physically really fit and she would do regular um, sport exercises. She was married, she didn't want to have children. Um, that's just an MRI picture of her spine which is in my view not so much connected to that. And from Tibetan medicine point of view, she just had like painful points on her head. Um, basically, where the, um, the, the lower part where you see number 21, that was the area where she had most of the pain. And if I would press there, she would complain about that pain. And okay, so I started that treatment. Um, I gave her all of these explanations about Sovarikpa. I tried to, from that draw to um, advices about lifestyle and stress um, and I started like an external therapy because she was basically um, using so many Western medications already and 
the situation is not that easy to use herbal medication in Switzerland. So at that time, I was reverting just to external therapies. And I chose something very easy to do, just 20 minutes sessions over the course of, I think, seven weeks and just once per week on the specific points. And OK, so the first three weeks, it was kind of discouraging because nothing happened. But then uh, at week after week number four, she explained to me that the duration of the headache had reduced significantly from five days for each time to just one day. So that's kind of really measurable, tangible. And after one more week, um, she noticed that the intensity of the headache had reduced by 50%, which is quite good. And after two more weeks of this um, simple treatment, she would say that it's the first time she wouldn't have any headache um, yeah, for the past two years. And uh, coincidentally, I think I used some cupping, additional cupping on her um, neck and lower back. She also, um, she also uh, reported that the lower back pain, pain has improved somehow. And um, we could, OK, I, I think I didn't mention it here. But uh, we could reduce her use of this tramadol. It's like an um, opioid used in Switzerland by 50%. She was on a heavy medication on that. So that was quite significant. And she wouldn't use any of the other medication anymore. So um, I, I mentioned like four different types of painkillers, of which three of them weren't used anymore. And um, the strongest one of them was reduced by half. So that's quite a good result for this very simple kind of treatment. And it was amazing for me to see that despite the fact that you had been treated by chemicals that could potentially you know, change your whole body, it was still, po it was still uh, possible to affect this case quite rapidly. I actually made, uh, met this patient one year later. Okay. And um, um, she uh, reported to me that she had to go to harvest, and that was the reason why we interrupted our seven weeks, uh, why we finished after seven weeks. Because my original plan was to at least do 10 weeks of treatment. But in any case, uh, she reported to me that after a few months of uh, freedom of pain, that pain came back. Never as bad as it was, but it came back on a regular base again. And she was thinking about coming back to me to uh, restart that treatment. Unfortunately, that was very recent, and I was going on a journey now for a trip. And so I couldn't schedule any meeting with her, any consultation. But in any case, what she mainly took from all of that was a lots, of, lots of advices about how to deal with the stress. So I don't, I don't really think that this acupuncture was the main thing that really helped her. I think it was the whole combination of um, explaining uh, different aspects according to Western medicine, according to Sovadikpa, and combining different kinds of um, approaches with her. And especially the stress management, which is so hard to approach, uh, is probably something that helped her and had a positive effect for a few months after, uh, to come after the treatment. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Nguyen, and it's really exciting to see in Switzerland that in private medical practice, at least, the ability to bring in so many good principles, so it's wonderful. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to our last speaker, because we're running a little bit short on time. Um, so Dr. Eve Henry grew up on the East Coast and completed her undergraduate uh, education at Princeton University and her medical training at Vanderbilt. She then came here to Stanford in 2013 for her residency in internal, me in an internal medicine, and she hasn't left since, sounds like, since she's now the concierge physician at Encina Practice and also the integrative consultant for Palo Alto Medical Foundation. She's clearly demonstrated her passion for understanding alternative medical systems and therapies. She trained under Dr. Weil, perhaps one of the founding members of uh, integrative medicine here in this nation at University of Arizona. And she's also trained in acupuncture, mindfulness meditation, worked with healers in India and the Amazon, and is board certified in integrative medicine and internal medicine and continuing her training in functional medicine, which I've just learned has roots in Tibetan medicine, at least from a theoretical perspective. So we look forward to hearing more. Thank you Thank very much. you so much. Thank you.
Thank you. I've been so excited to, to finally make it. Dr. Weirich has invited me, I think, every year for the last three years, and I've always been either exceedingly pregnant or just had a baby. So this is the first time I was able to make it. So I wanted to use my 15 minutes of fame today to talk about a topic that's really near and dear to my heart, and it's the patient-doctor relationship. So we've heard a little bit in the last few days about the importance of the patient-doctor relationship in Tibetan medicine. And that's true in every medical philosophy I've studied. The patient-doctor relationship is truly key to healing. And unfortunately, in Western medicine today, it's significantly strained. So I wanted to start by just talking a little bit about kind of the state of Western medicine today. So gone are the days kind of featured over here, where there's an individual practitioner who's able to go to a patient's home who intimately knows the family. Now physicians are much more likely to be part of very large organizations. Patients are cared for in teams, teams that include a variety of practitioners from nurse practitioners, physician assistants, nurses. There's this kind of ever-present and important third party in the relationship, which is the insurance companies who actually make significant treatment decisions because they kind of decide what's going to be paid for in the end. Physicians now have a lot more patients than they've ever had before. An average primary care doctor has 2,500 people that they're individually responsible for. And visits have gotten significantly shorter. Average visit in the United States is seven to 10 minutes with the physician. And now there's, something else kind of within the relationship, the electronic medical record that demands so much attention and time. So I chose this cartoon because I think it's a great representation of how the patient-doctor relationship has evolved and how it's gotten more and more crowded. And in the last picture, you see that there's like this growing distance between the physician and the patient. And the first question to ask is to say, you know, is this a problem? Like clearly things have changed, but are physicians or patients suffering at all? And my personal answer to that question is yes. So in the United States, we have an epidemic of unhappy doctors. You may have heard the term burnout because it has now bubbled up into kind of a, like the media and our mass consciousness. Burnout is marked by three spiritual states, one of emotional exhaustion, a lack of meaning in work, and a depersonalization of patients. I found this quote, which is written by one of the kind of leading scholars in physician burnout, and I thought it was a really apt description. It's described as an erosion of the soul caused by a deterioration of one's values, dignity, spirit, and will. So clearly, that's a problem for the physician and for the patient. And it's only getting more and more pervasive in medicine. I found two studies both performed in 2018, so very recent this year. One of 15,000 physicians and 42% reported significant symptoms of burnout. Another study somewhat smaller of 9,000 physicians reported an even higher percentage. 78% of physicians were reporting symptoms of burnout. And this is very disturbing to me, 40%, so almost half of all the physicians surveyed were basically planning an exit strategy for medicine. They were planning to either leave completely or significantly reduce their hours. And this trickles down to patients. So there's a lot of concern about the quality of care that physicians, when they're feeling this kind of spiritual and moral distress, can truly provide. There are studies showing that burned out physicians suffer from impaired attention, memory, and impaired executive function. There are higher rates of medical errors confirmed when physicians experience symptoms of burnout. Patient satisfaction directly correlates with the level of physician satisfaction, which makes a lot of sense. It's probably not a great experience to be cared for by someone in that state. And then the corollary to that is that patient compliance and the desire and will to follow a treatment plan directly correlates with their satisfaction in the visit. So this is clearly an issue. And when you look at the literature to kind of look at all the different changes and ask 
what's truly the problem? You know, we know there's so many variables and so many things have changed, but what's actually causing the growing distance between patients and physicians? And it really boils down to three main issues. One is there's just not enough time in a visit. Two, the electronic medical record demands too much attention. And three, there are simply too many patients per physician. So I wanted to just give a little bit more literature and kind of understanding to each of these three buckets. So first, the big bucket of time. So as reimbursement rates have declined, visits have shortened all across the country. Shorter visits are associated with worse outcomes and interestingly, more medication prescriptions. So I found this one study from a pulmonology clinic which showed that increasing the visit time from four minutes to 20 minutes, and like first take a moment to realize that their visit time was four minutes, which is like kind of hard to imagine. But they made the doctor stay in the room for 20 minutes. And what they found was that the asthma control and then a bunch of quality of life metrics for these patients that were seen on those longer visit days was significantly better one month out after that visit. Visit less than 15 minutes long, which now, if you go back to that first slide where we talk about the average being 7 to 10, so that's almost all visits, increase the risk of inappropriate prescriptions to patients. These are prescriptions that are potentially dangerous for the patient because they may conflict with an allergy, another medication, a whole host of issues. And doctors who feel time pressure are more likely to write a prescription. So there are many instances in which you can educate the patient, teach them how to change something where a prescription may not be necessary, but if you only have six minutes, it's simply faster to hand out a piece of paper than it is to talk and educate. Two, the electronic medical record. Although I do believe it was built with the best intentions in mind, it is now a huge burden on kind of the average physician. So I found two studies which just demonstrate the vast amount of time that is spent logging in data into computers. And the second one I think is the most demonstrative, which is for primary care physicians who work a little over 11 hours a day, roughly six of those hours are spent purely on data entry. So it's about 50% of a doctor's work. And it's, it's an interesting thing because doctors in general are not people who love computers. If we did, we would be engineers. It's more lucrative. We chose medicine because we like people and we like talking and we like touching and getting involved with people's life. And now about 50% of our time is doing something that is just spiritually and personality-wise very challenging for us. And lastly, the too many patients factor. So there's some, a lot of interesting research going on on what is the key panel size and how much time do doctors really need to do a good job. And this is just a couple of little points. But one study reduced panel size by just a little bit. So it took it down from about 2,000, 2,500 to 1,800 and gave physicians some flexibility about how long they saw each patient. And I found this study kind of very early on in its progress, so it's only been going on for like a little over a month, but it had already started to reduce the rates of burnout. There was a really interesting Kaiser pilot study, which has continued and the final data is not released yet, but they brought the panel size down to 200, and they found that they were able to reduce ER visits by 80% when the physicians really had enough time to know those 200 patients. And the last study I wanted to highlight was a University of Chicago study. And this study specifically gave primary care doctors the time to go see their patients in the hospital. So this is something that used to be commonplace with a primary care doctor. If you were hospitalized, your doctor would come visit you. This is now basically impossible in our current medical setting. One, because there's 2,500 people, so that's a huge amount of time, but also because the days are so busy you're spending 11 hours seeing 27 patients and responding to messages, there's, it's simply impossible. And what they found was when primary care doctors were actually given back this time, they were able to decrease the rate of subsequent hospitalizations for their patients by 22% for the following year. 
And all of the patients in the study actually had improved mental health outcomes compared to controls. So that amount of time that they were able to spend really did make a big difference for their patients. OK, so is there any sign of improvement? So I didn't want to spend too long here because we only have a little bit of time together. But I just wanted to talk about a couple of exciting things that are happening, some here in the Bay Area and some other places in the country. So there are a couple of startups and new different models playing with this length of visit and the panel size. And they're mostly doing it by manipulating who is paying for the physician's time. We'll go into that in a little bit more detail. And then the other thing I wanted to highlight is this kind of acknowledgement and effort that the electronic medical record is something that is now kind of getting in the way of the patient-doctor relationship. There's this new initiative by CMS called Patients Over Paperwork. And there's also a growing use of scribes. So briefly, I just wanted to talk about a couple of new and innovative ways that people are thinking about primary care and how we can get that flexibility to kind of increase the amount of time that physicians have with, with uh, their patients. The first is this new thing called direct primary care. And there are a lot of solo direct primary care practices popping up across the country. In these practices, the patient pays the physician through a membership fee and does not use insurance to bill for the visits. Similarly is a, a company called One Medical, which is kind of all over this area, so many of you may have heard about it. This uses, still uses insurance, so kind of more used to our traditional kind of way that we pay for things, but have patients pay a much smaller membership fee to kind of have this adjunct to have them have longer visit times. Then there's the group called Crossover Health. So in this group, actually companies are paying Crossover directly to take care of their employees. So again, a slight shift in terms of who's paying. But all of these different experiments are allowing physicians to have more time with their patients and allowing less um, kind of patients per physician overall. And the last one I put up there is actually really interesting and is pre-launch. So this doesn't exist yet, but it's kind of in the works. It's a company called Prime Meridian. One thing that's kind of clear is that the vast majority of innovation around this issue is occurring in primary care. But this is not just a primary care problem. Cardiologists, rheumatologists, kind of all physicians have these kind of same restrictions. Um, Prime Meridian is trying to open a membership-based health system, which actually includes specialists and inpatient treatment. So this is really unique. It's never been done before. It's set to open its first couple of clinics in Utah, and we'll see if that's at all successful. And lastly, there is some kind of improvement and focus on improving the electronic medical record. The easiest way that people have figured out how to do it is to put scribes in there. It doesn't really solve the problem. It just creates, in my opinion, another person kind of in the patient-doctor relationship. But at least it frees the doctor up to going back to what they should be doing. And it's been shown to improve both physician and patient satisfaction across the board. As I said before, in 2017, CMS launched this kind of intention to reduce regulatory burden. I haven't seen any outcomes of that yet, but at least there's an acknowledgement that there's a problem. And so hopefully over the years, there'll be a bit of a solution. And then there's a lot of research going on in terms of artificial intelligence interventions with the electronic medical record. I feel most physicians are a little bit hesitant in that realm because of the experience with the electronic medical record and how it hasn't kind of been what we hoped it would be for the patient-doctor relationship. But hopefully, we can figure out ways to use technology in a way that is truly helpful to the patient-doctor relationship. And that's it. Thank you so much. So first of all, I just want to say thank you to each of you. Excellent presentations and really exciting to see all of your work in uh, bridging both the clinical and research spaces. So I want to first open it up to the audience um, so that we have enough time. Is there any um, first questions for our panelists? Yes, Dr. Pissar. I'm wondering, um, you know, in your study, 
study, like how many men and women is that percentage? And if there are any differences at all in the responsiveness to the uh, traditional Tibetan diet and their effectiveness for men and women. So I think I'm supposed to repeat the question so that we get it on our audio. So the question is, what is the uh, breakdown between men and women in the study? Yeah. And the difference in outcomes. Right, uh, we, 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 we never looked into that. We just included uh, the criteria. The inclusive criteria is not between the genders, so we didn't look into that uh, especially. In general, would you say men and women pretty much respond both as a yeah. Women? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All women? of them responded well. I have one more question for Dr. Cameron. Yeah. Um, the so I'm retired now. So I notice in, in our system you know, we have many different levels of nursing all the way from LPN up to nurse practitioner. So I'm curious, because I don't know, in the traditional Tibetan um, medical uh, system, uh, what is the role of nursing and are there different levels of education, experience, uh, and how do they work collaboratively with uh, the physicians? She wants to know what is the role of a nurse in Tibetan medicine, and I'm so glad you asked because I was going to mention something about that. But in 2016, I had the opportunity to visit the Tibetan Medical College, so I know Dr. Uh, Kunchak, who is here. And at the time, they had developed the first uh, Tibetan medicine nursing program, and they wanted some input, which I tried to help with. But traditionally, Tibetan medicine that it's been directly between the doctor and the, and the patient. So the doctor, as Tani said, is a vehicle of compassion. You know, people get sick if no one listens to them. And if, if they go to a doctor and they're pushed off quickly, so the relationship between a doctor and patient is very important in Tibetan medicine. So nurses have not been part of that, and midwives help women uh, have babies. Um, but now there is a Tibetan medicine nursing program in, uh, in uh, Tibet, and the nurses, the people who graduate, it's a four-year program, and the, and the graduates of that program have to pass the same nursing licensure exam that other nurses have to pass. Yeah, so, go ahead, yeah. And I'm Yosef, could you speak also from the traditional perspective as well? Yeah, as far as our <coughs> Yushi says, uh, the basic requirement for a successful treatment, we have to have a good doctor. That's very important. Then really we have to have a good quality of medicine. Then the assistant. And nowadays we have the nurses as an assistant. And the, the quality of nurses is again important over here. The nurses must be again intelligent compassionate and must be very careful about the hygienic conditions. So these are the basic requirements of a nurses or assistant, whoever he, uh, is helping the patient, you know, whether it's a family member or the friends or in a family setup as a nurses. Let me say one more thing is we talked about integrative care. In Dharamsala, uh, there, there's Delic Hospital, which is a Western type facility that has medical doctors and nurses. Mensa Kong, which just has doctors, they work very closely together, for example, on TB. And so the uh, patient with TB would go to the uh, Delic Hospital for antibiotics, you know, any kind of tests. But then at the same time, uh, the person would be seen by a Tibetan doctor, a doctor of Tibetan medicine, and, uh, and for in enhancing the immune system, for uh, you know, building up the person, uh, uh, dealing with side effects. And so they've been doing that together. And when I went to uh, Shining, to the Tibetan Med Medical College, they told us about many examples of that. So the Tibetan doctors then do work with nurses like in a Western facility. Can I say something? Um, I just want to explain how we're doing it in Switzerland. Maybe it's an approach that can be applied in other places as well. So in my absence, I've been away from my job basically for two months now. And I have, over the 
course of months instructed many of the assistants and nurses at my place and they are currently now um, dealing with my patients so it's, it's a quite new model that they approach in Switzerland um, it's like having the nurses being educated and trained as kind of assistants to doctors and being able to cover for doctors for specific areas so all my external therapies that I've been doing with my various patients are now being covered by the nurses in my clinic but I had the chance to um, train them um, during the course of the past few months knowing that I would be away for a while from my job so they're doing it right now and I'm sometimes receiving like um, feedback from them um, via mobile and they would be asking questions so I think the um, Sovadikpa system allows for a person that has some basic knowledge in medicine to easily adapt to these kinds of situation and take over for a certain part like instructing in diet and lifestyle is something very easily for Swiss nurses to take over and also external therapies. And Shining, they really play a primary role in all the departments, so they're doing a lot of the accessory therapies, um, intricately involved in a lot of patient care, so you see a really beautiful relationship with that um, in Amdo as well, Shining. Yeah, yeah. Aren't, they, aren't they starting to do a Tibetan medical nursing program yeah. at the university? Yeah, 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 that's what they're doing. Can I say one more thing about this? The, school, the dean of the School of Nursing at the University of Minnesota were very much into integrative care, and we have the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, so we've been into this line of thinking for quite a while. Anyway, she would like to see more uh, Tibetan students in nursing and more Tibetan faculty or people who, faculty who have a knowledge of Tibetan values, because she wants to bring this into the curriculum. And in Minnesota, Tibetans primarily are nursing assistants in the hospitals and do housekeeping in the hotels, uh, and they work all the time, and then, they, uh, then their children go on to be nurses and physicians and, and lawyers and so on. But anyway, the Minnesota hospitals could not get along without them and are very grateful for the kind of kindness that Tibetans bring as they are, are uh, whether they're cleaning the floor or they're a uh, nursing assistant, they're, they're very grateful. And more and more now, there are Tibetan nurses, and Lobsang over there is a Tibetan doctor in Minnesota, and so they're a gift to Minnesota. I have a question to follow up to Dr. Henry. So on the integrative medical perspective, what is the role of nursing in that integrative medicine model? So in most integrative clinics, it sounds very similar to what was described, which is there is the a wide use of both nurses as well as acupuncturists, massage therapists to kind of create and serve this more holistic pattern. So currently at Palo Alto Medical Foundation in our growing integrative medicine department, we are in the process of hiring a nurse practitioner to help and health coaches to help lead a lot of the implant, implantation aspect of some of the consultations. Um, because there's such an issue with access to physicians in this area, specifically surrounding integrative medicine, the amount of physicians trained to do it versus the amount of public interest is so discordant that it takes months to get in and then months to get in again. So having a team approach in that regard has been amazing um, and we're hoping to expand it. And if you look at groups like the UCSF group, um, that's a very common model that's being utilized. I, I'm an assistant at a biopharmaceutical company, so I'm new to the industry. But I love, and I'm, I'm always, I'm, I'm always looking for ideas. But and we perform, you know, um, non-clinical trials and clinical trials. Like I'm still learning everything. But wouldn't that be amazing for our clinical trials if they had, you know, a study where they, you know, were testing the, the new drug, but then, you know, tested, you know, had people in their sample in their clinical trials in this study, but in this study they incorporated, you know, Tibetan medicine in this study, and then they, you know what, they saw the improvement here, but then they saw, you know, 100% improvement in this study. With, so I was wondering if your slides would be available that I could present this to my teams, because I support like four or five different departments in my companies, but are your, like, I, did, I liked all the, um, the slides and the facts and everything, are those available? 
you guys provide this list? Oh, yeah. Sure. So she's a uh, biomedical pharmaceutical company? Biopharmaceutical. Biopharmaceutical <laughs> company and was wondering about um, randomized control trials integrating um, herbal formulas from Tibetan medicine. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, okay. why, why not just, I mean, all they can do is they know. So I, I mean, I just think, you know, why not ask or just put the idea out there? Great. So there's been growing work in this area for sure. We can more. You know what needs to be done is in Ayurveda they've started studying how do people say with a bacon constitution versus tipa versus lung, how do they metabolize medicines? And they're finding that people who have a bacon constitution, they don't metabolize the medicines as fast. And so maybe they don't seem to be working and then the doctor gives more medicine and then it can build up in the body. Whereas someone with a TIPA constitution, they can metabolize it very fast. One other issue as far as doing testing on Tibetan medicines, Tibetans have lost so much. We've had many, many conversations about this, both in Tibet and at Mensakong and Dharamsala. Tibetans have lost so much and pharmaceutical companies would like to get the recipes for the Tibetan medicines and, and then not pay the Tibetans for these medicines. So they are working hard to hold on to these medicines. And a complication is that many Tibetan medicines have up to like even 100 ingredients. And so to test each ingredient, you know, it's not like say testing turmeric and then saying, okay, this is the uh, result. How do you test something with that many ingredients? And finally, Herbs are not the same. Tibetan medicines primarily are made of herbs. <clears throat> They're not like uh, chemicals because they, one herb may be, even though it's the same herb, it may be different because of where it's grown or what the environment is or whatever compared to another one. And so the, that's hard to test also. Those are variables. Uh, uh, there are two Tibetan herbal formulas, uh, recognized in Switzerland as a Western drug. <coughs> one is Sindhu 5, pomegranate 5, and one is the camphor 28. So those two medicines, if you search in Switzerland, they are known as a Western drug. But they are produced by Padma Company. Yeah. So I, I think uh, one aspect which is good because Tibetan uh, pharmacies are uh, proved by the scientific study and research. And actually this Tibetan formula is the first to find in the entire European history, pharmaceutical history, that recognized the, the herbal formula as a drug. So that, I'm just going to repeat so they can hear on the recording. So Dr. Nito is saying about the Padma, which is a Swiss company that um, was using formulas that were um, brought in from a Buryatia family that had a, a medical lineage. And so they use those formulas and have been doing extensive research um, on those with Hadassah Medical Center in Israel. And so two formulas particularly have been recognized in Europe and are now sold extensively all over Europe and Switzerland has been leading the charge on that. Um, and so the Cedar 5 and then Gapernyake, yeah. um, so Camper 28 as well. So you can see a lot of that literature and we're happy to share that with, uh, with symposium attendees as well. But there's some great growing literature, but part of the issue that they've been looking at is we need to bring in network pharmacology and systems biology to look at the complexity of these formulas. So if you would be interested in working with that, that'd be great. Any other questions? I think we need to thank our panelists and thank you so much for taking